In this set of charts, we provide an introduction to the class. The class that we're working in is Analytical Methods for Multivariable and Discrete Time Systems. And the goal here is to provide an introduction to the class that kind of outlines previous course material that you should be familiar with and how it is very similar to the course material we'll be studying in this class. Essentially, this is a linear systems class that focuses on discrete time signals and systems. Here's a short outline of the introductory slides here. We will be spending time talking about signals and systems. So we'll talk about continuous time signals, discrete time signals, continuous time systems, discrete time systems. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about the different domains that we'll be talking about signals and systems in. In a previous class, you got very familiar talking about signals in the continuous time domain, in the frequency domain, in the Laplace domain. We'll do similar things in this class. We'll talk about signals in the discrete time domain. We'll also talk about the frequency domain, representation of signals and systems. And we'll also introduce a new domain called the Z domain. Okay. We'll spend some time reviewing how we perform analysis in the time domain, both continuous time, which you're familiar with, and discrete time, which is the emphasis of this class. And then we'll provide some comparison and contrast between transforms you're used to, the Fourier transform, the Laplace transform, and the new transforms we'll be learning about in this class, the discrete time Fourier transform, the Z transform, and some other things like that. We'll also spend a little bit of time reviewing some other basic mathematics, complex numbers, and things like that. So like I said earlier, the goal of this set of charts is to provide an introduction to the class. And what we're going to do is we're going to provide a review of the things that you should know from your continuous time linear systems course. And we're going to outline a lot of the things that we'll be studying in detail in the class and try to put them in context with material that you already know. So there are a lot of similarities about the things we'll be learning in this class that focuses on discrete time signals and systems and trying to understand how those kind of match up or pair up with the things you already understand in the continuous time world is very useful and helps keep things organized in our brain about what all these different acronyms and transforms are. So trying to get that context and see how these things match up is the goal of this introductory set of slides. So let's first talk about signals. Signals are the things we often deal with in this class, plotting and inputting into systems, filtering, things like that. So what is a signal? So here's our definition of a signal for the class. A signal is a function of one or more variables that contains information. In previous classes, we focused almost exclusively on continuous time signals that were a function of just one variable, the time domain variable t. So we're used to working with time domain signals that are a function of just one variable t. And we spent a lot of time in previous classes talking about signal properties. If I gave you a signal x of t, you could tell me things about it. You could tell me that it was continuous, if it was an energy signal, if it was a power signal, if it was periodic. All these different properties of the signal you could tell me about the signal. We're going to do very similar things in this class. The difference is that we'll be focusing on discrete time signals. So instead of having an x of t that uses these parentheses for notation, we're going to be focusing on discrete time signals that use these brackets for notation. So when we talk about a discrete time signal, we'll write down things like x of n, or sometimes we'll write down x of k. k is just an integer, n is just an integer. So the values from k can go, you know, minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to infinity. Same thing for n. So k and n are just integers that we use. And depending on the textbook you use, sometimes you'll call things x of k, sometimes you'll call things x of n. But k and n are just our discrete time variables. And that's why we call these discrete time signals, because they take on discrete quantities. That's very different from the variable t, that we've used previously because t can take on a continuum of values. It can take on the value 1.0, it can take on the value 1.00001 or 1.00001. It can take on a whole continuum of values. That's why they are continuous time signals. The signal is actually valued for any value t on the real line, whereas the discrete time signals that we study in this class are only good for integer values of time. Also notice in our definition of signal, it says that a signal is a function of one or more variables. Most of the time we deal with 
a signal that is a function of one variable, either t or n or k. But signals can have more than one dimension. So these are what we would call one-dimensional signals because they only have one variable that you query them with to figure out their value. But signals can have more than one dimension. Images, for example, you know, an image that you're viewing right now on your computer screen has two dimensions. It has a horizontal axis and a vertical axis. And depending on where you query that image, you get a certain color from the image. So that an image is a two-dimensional signal because any point in space described by two dimensions, you get a value. Just like when you query these signals at some one specific point in time, you get a value. So signals aren't necessarily always one dimensional like this, that you would just plot versus one variable. Sometimes the signals we deal with, like images for example, could be two dimensions, and signals can be even higher dimensions than that. So there's no limit on the amount of dimensions that we can, can have or work with, but for the most part we, we tend to work with time domain signals because as electrical engineers, those tend to be the ones that are most important for us. So signals are one important quantity that we spend a lot of time dealing with, plotting, analyzing. Systems are the other main important quantity that we deal with during the semester. So what is a system? A system is an entity that manipulates signals to accomplish a specific function, often yielding new signals. In this class, when we draw a system, we often represent it as just kind of this box. So we have some input signal, x of t. It goes into our system, and what comes out of our system is some new signal, y of t. So we've spent a lot of time in previous classes dealing with continuous time systems. So a continuous time system is one that takes as input a continuous time signal and yields a output continuous time signal. We talked about the properties of these systems. Is this a linear system? Is it a time invariant system? It is, is it a bounded input, bounded output system? So we've learned how to do that. We're going to be doing very similar things in this class. The only difference being we'll be dealing with discrete time systems. So a discrete time system is one that takes some discrete time input into the system and yields some discrete time output signal. So very, very similar to things you've done before, and we'll be doing many of the same things in terms of classifying discrete time systems. So we'll be asking the same types of questions. Is this discrete time system linear? Is it time invariant? Is it stable? Things like that. Most of the time in this class, yeah, we think about a system as, as this box. In the real world, obviously, the system could be something very complicated. It could be a signal processor that takes some input signal in a communication system, filters it, manipulates it, digs out user data to spit out you know, bits or some other signal. So the system itself in the real world could be something very complicated. We're treating it as this kind of this building block and we're going to analyze it for specific properties. But in the real world, you know, given a specific instance of this thing, it can be something very complicated. A radar signal processor, a communication system, some filter for reducing noise and interference and a comm signal, something like that. Also notice how notation helps us. In this top block diagram here, I actually specifically put DT for discrete time to indicate this was a discrete time system. But in some sense, that was almost unnecessary because the notation of the signals that we're using tells us that these are discrete time signals. When I use the notation X of T with these parentheses, I look at that and our convention says that is how we represent and write down mathematically a continuous time signal. That's what we've agreed to do when we write down continuous time signals. Similarly, when I use these brackets, X of bracket of K, that is the convention that we use to indicate a discrete time signal. So even though I was very explicit right here by putting the DT for discrete time, if I had not done that and I just had written a box that said system, by looking at the notation of the input and output signals, you would have known this is obviously a discrete time system because he's using notation for discrete time signals as the inputs and outputs.